Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Promax Industries with Dick Adi. We're going to talk today about heterogeneous integration. So Dick, we've heard a lot about heterogeneous integration over the past couple decades. What's different now? What's changed? The term, as a result of the industry's efforts to deal with uh, what is generally regarded in the industry as sort of the, the plateauing, the end of Moore's Law. Moore's Law and the improvements in semiconductor were really driven for decades by the ability to improve lithography. We've now gotten down to the point where the features are just a few atoms across and you can't make them less than one atom, as you would expect. Uh, to continue the increased functionality per unit density that is so important to reduce cost, increase functionality per unit volume, the industry has come up with what next? Called more than more. Uh, one of the, in the jargon of the industry, one of the thing, the terms that's being used is heterogeneous integration. That term is being interpreted by various participants in the electronic industry in different ways. So let's take a closer look. Okay. Dick, what are we looking at? Well, these are some of the ways that the term heterogeneous integration and the structures that they're being uh, built with are, are described. Uh, for example, the, the, the term implies multiple different things of some category put together. In the, the, in the industry, there are two kinds of things. One is different materials, and the other one is different kinds of parts. And for example, the, the, the simplest and the original concept for heterogeneous integration came out of the semiconductor industry, where you've got a, a silicon wafer here where I've cut out a piece of it as a typical die. And instead of having only silicon as the active material in the, in the dye, people came up with the concept of using indium phosphide, germanium, and other materials. They're integrated into it. And as soon as they started using more than the conventional silicon dopants and what have you, that term started to be called heterogeneous integration for obvious reasons. And that is widely used. There's a whole series of evolution going on around this concept here, especially as we get to the finer and finer nodes and get down into the less than 10 nanometer regimes. And these kind of things are being done. Indium phosphide, for example, is being put in photonic integrated circuits to give gain uh, for optical devices on silicon, because silicon is not a direct band gap material as indium phosphide is. Germanium is being put down for photo detectors because it's really a good material con to convert light to electrons. And all this is, is now on dye, but you're, we're also going into packages too, right? This is how we're going to put all these pieces together. Yes, U ultimately these things have to be packaged one way or another. Uh, and the packaging gets to be more complex as you would expect. Um, if for, the, if you, for the photonic integrated circuits, for example, uh, packaging is often done in, in, in ceramic packages because of rigid stability. Uh, ability to tolerate temperature uh, and handle heat. Uh, that is not ideal from a cost point of view, of course, and there's a lot of effort in the industry to figure out how to utilize these more complex structures with lower cost packaging schemes, built on lead frames, built with over molding and the more conventional low cost schemes that everybody's familiar with. And that's requiring the development of new materials, new polymers for encapsulation, et cetera. So there are some challenges in picking the right package here though, right? Uh, yes, very much so. And the package is a strong function of the end use. And the parameters that one has to look at is first the physical size of the die, its characteristics and what it needs for a package to be protected on the one hand and interconnected with the next layer and how it can handle thermal, which is in recent years risen to be almost the dominant issue in, in next generation packaging, particularly for the high power devices that are rapidly emerging to support automotive. It, it, a lot of those devices use surprisingly large amounts of copper. They operate at surprisingly high temperatures. Some of them literally glow in the dark. And to package those kind of devices takes some real innovation. And of course, we all started out using what we had uh, we get into it, we discover the limits, we go to the basic physics and say, what can we do to get better performance? What do we have to change? What's needed in the structure, the materials, the, the assembly processes? So what happens in materials? Are we still using the same materials or are we now experimenting with all sorts of novel ones? 
oh, there's all kinds of efforts going on and have been for years into looking at new materials. Liquid crystal polymers, for example, have been out there for a while. Uh, uh, um, graphene has been out there for a while and has been emerging. Uh, a diamond, for example, every 10 years, somebody comes up with a way to dramatically reduce the cost of diamond to incorporate it to get its enormously high thermal conductivity. There's been a recent group of those that have shown up. Um, in signals for, for communication and to handle the very high densities of information that are now being used in artificial intelligence dye and, uh, and image recognition dye uh, that are sort of built at the, the really the fine leading edge uh, nodes, uh, five nanometer, et cetera, nodes. They have very large numbers of IOs, thousands of IO per die is now common. So that's the exact opposite of the, of the automotive industry where you've got four or five leads that handle hundreds of amps. Now you're down into handling pico amps here, but there's thousands of them that have to be interconnected. And of course, if one of them is not connected, funny things happen, maybe, unless you've got redundancy built in and more and more redundancy is being built and so you go those kind of directions. Your first diagram here is what's happening on dye. What yeah. happens on wafer? How does that change? Well, uh, th this is all being done on wafer, okay? Once you've got the wafer and you start to singulate it in the individual dye of all sorts that can be made these days, the next thing is how do you combine them together? And one of the common things you're hearing about these days is chiplets and interposers. And, you know, an interposer, for example, can be a printed circuit board or it can be aluminum oxide or silicon or even glass and with interconnect structures built on it and in it. And then there's a variety of different kinds of devices that can be mounted on it. Now, this is not a new concept. Historically, we call these hybrids. And what, what's happened in recent years is, is the features have gotten a lot finer. And the ability, classic hybrids were built with thick film, and that's really te technology that's inadequate for what's needed today for these high densities that we're achieving. So now you've got to go to thin film structures that can get to micron, or well, 10 micron kind of dimensions for lines and spaces. And that's what's needed on substrates to interconnect dye. And of course, once you have a platform that you can put dye down, there's nothing that keeps you from putting down a, a silicon dye made at 60 nanometers here, one made at leading edge 10 nanometers over here, maybe a photonic integrated circuit built here that has no electronics, just waveguides in it. Uh, maybe something made with gallium arsenide. And then you want to interconnect all of these. And the interconnect scheme that's being talked about a lot is something called chiplets. And they have, there are all kinds of schemes out there for interconnecting them. Some of them use flip chip and just mount them on the board and have the interconnects uh, built into the substrate. Others put polymers in between them and build some kind of a bridge across them. Uh, the, the, the Intel has several schemes, TSMC has several schemes. And the big issue with this is how do you get dye from different vendors to work together in your device? And today, that frankly is difficult. It's one of the directions that the industry is emerging. Because in the old days, uh, in the early days of packaging integrated circuits, every manufacturer had their own package. And eventually we, we went to a series of standards. The dual inline package, the BGAs that are so common now, uh, that's, the QFNs that are really built to a very industry standard. And that's what's going to happen ultimately with, with chiplets. But it's unclear what the interconnect method will be and what the dimensions and all that will be yet. But it's just emerging. And it also depends on things like uh, characterization of the individual chiplets, the coefficients of thermal expansion, all those kinds of issues you have to think about, right? That most of this has been one vendor doing all everything themselves, right? Yeah, so, yes. So what changes when you start getting into a commercial chiplet world? Yes, well, that gets to be really interesting because now the designer, he's getting parts from vendor A and vendor B, and his issue is how does he interconnect them? He becomes the designer of the interposer. He becomes the designer of the interconnect structure. And I anticipate the arrival in the industry of, of a new service of people like us providing schemes for making interconnections be chip, between chiplets from a variety of sources. And what sort of issues do you run into there that you have to resolve? Oh, everything you can imagine. How do you put them down? What is the metallization on the die? What metals can be used to connect die A to die B? What's its physical geometry? How do you ensure that it has a performance in the real world of 
uh, highly accelerated testing, uh, thermal cycling, exposure to humidity, and all those kind of issues. So there's a lot of development to be done to qualify uh, interconnect schemes for this. And they will initially be done by the big guys like Intel, TSMC, but eventually they will come down to being available broadly for the industry. But it's going to take a while. You're talking five, ten years. Another issue that comes up here is when you think about uh, most of the chips that have been designed, there's a fair amount of margin built into those uh, one die type of chips. Now that you start putting multiple dies together, you're starting to try and cut down that margin, right? Because you really want to narrow down to this is exactly what you need. Yeah, oh, very much so. The, the, the reason to go from package die to bare die, as is being done in Interposer, is to get rid of all of the parasitics associated with the interconnect path. And one of the things that you want to get rid of, frankly, is the ESD protection. People don't generally know it, but most dye that are commercially used have got a fair amount of ES a space used to provide, provide ESD protection so the devices don't fail. So all of a sudden, vendors like us that have to, to, to build these devices have to have really good ESD control in our environments. You can't just build them like you do in a surface mount environment where it's kind of out in the open. You've got to build them in a room, uh, to sort of a clean room that has very good control on ESD. Uh, that means very good, very high humidity, at, at least 40%, ideally closer to 60, uh, and uh, good gowning and all those things here when you take the ESD out of the dye and, and then start working with them. And that's one of the things going on. We're starting to see that kind of thing. We always have because we've always done a lot with raw dye that are test structures for our industry being here in Silicon Valley as we are. So where does this go next? Well, we started out doing something, adding extra stuff to the dye at the wafer fab level. Then we talked about how we take a bunch of different sources of dye and put them together. The next thing that's happened is people have taken this term heterogeneous integration and pushed it even further. Instead of, instead of putting down just elect, electronic parts and semiconductor devices, they're now doing things like taking a substrate here of some sort, mount, putting mechanical parts on it that might be electrical connectors or things to screw it into something or something to provide a heat path out. Or they might have a chemistry on it, for example, for biotech analysis where you interact with the electronics that might be built into the substrate. Or you might have optics on it in the form of a prism or a lenses or dichroic filters. And all of those are all built up in the third dimension. And when you start taking non-electronic components and combining it with electronics, you have to modify your assembly processes to accommodate these characteristics. For example, if you put a chemistry on a surface and you want to build it into something, the issues you get into is first, you can't water wash it anymore. Secondly, you can't heat it to 260 degrees centigrade to reflow solder it. In fact, some of the materials that we see, you can't even heat to 40 degrees centigrade. You can't go above body temperature. So when you're not working on them, you got storm and refrigerator, for example. Uh, optical devices are highly susceptible to scratching and, and particles. And a lot of electronic at the assembly level, particles are not a big deal. But when you get into optics, a five micron particle can ruin an image sensor, for example, that's got one, two uh, micron pixels in it. One particle, bam, the whole thing doesn't get, you get a you know, blob in the image. So. So the trend initially when we first got it into packaging is, oh, we're going to move some of the things that are on the, the PCB into the, the package. This is now multiple PCBs, right? Yes, this can be multiple PCBs here to all work together uh, and some kind of a structure. And this may or may not be a printed circuit board. It, it could be something else. But the circuit boards, uh, uh, interposers built on silicon or ceramic, or all of those things are being done. This is smaller, faster, uh, not necessarily less expensive, right? Uh, agreed. The objective generally is to get greater functionality, uh, it's smaller physical volume, and ultimately lower cost. In, in general, our functionality has been going up so fast that our costs have, have not kept, have not, uh, uh, haven't gone up as fast. And we're getting far and more functionality per unit dollar here as time goes. One of the things that's going on is that we've discovered that all of these things can be miniaturized as well. So the quantities of material consumed are actually going down. And we're putting more effort into value added, meaning processes of some sort, to, to manipulate the relative declining quantities of material we're utilizing. Is heat the number one challenge here? Uh, it, it depends upon the application. In, in automotive high power devices, for sure. 
And photonic devices, yes, it's a major driver. What do you, where do you put the laser? Because you, it, the, the photonic devices like these are highly susceptible to thermal expansion here, given, the, the label, given how sensitive light is. Automotive, it's a driver. Uh, uh, and signal integrity kinds of things, it's not, it's not a driver there yet. But it, it's getting there. What do we need next to make all this work? We need continuing evolu evolution and development of new materials and new processes and things to be built smaller. You know, th those people who are skilled in mechanics and machining, for example, there's kind of a magic number in machining. If you try to make something that with a precision of more than about two tenths of a mil, uh, which is 10 microns in the world of mechanics, that's really hard to machine parts that's something tighter than that. In the world of electronics that we're working in here, there's nothing magic about 10 microns. We're way below that in size and many things we're doing. And what's necessary now is for us to develop methods of fabricating parts with tolerances far tighter than are traditionally done in, in metal devices. Semiconductor has the lithography to do it. The MEMS devices that we build, of course, are built with far tighter tolerances than that. And that kind of demand is going everywhere. So processes that can have handle very small parts with very tight tolerances are a major need that is evolving and it's just going to continue going. There's a famous paper by a guy named Fenman, a physicist at Caltech, that says there's a lot of room at the, at the, at the bottom. And we are still chasing that. We are nowhere near the limits of what is viable here. And given the trends, it's just going to keep going for at least another decade, maybe two. Dick Gotti, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome.